that which was for, from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, of the word of life. For the life was manifest, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifest unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these right things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Will you please turn uh, with me to our screen, and please rise. Uh, to, uh, for our first hymn this morning, the Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid when the weak please bow with me. Dear most holy God and Father, you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You formed the dust of this earth into your own likeness and breathed your breath into man. The soul you have given to each of us is from that 
very beginning and from that very breath. We are each connected to you and you are connected to each of us. You made us differently from all your other cre creations. You gave us free will and the ability to choose. You made us to be intelligent so that we might know how to live our lives pleasing to you. You gave us your living word to guide us along life's pathways. With free will, we can choose, but with those choices come responsibility for the choices we make. You showed your great love for us by sending your only son to die for our sins so that we may become free from the slavery sin bound us to. You asked so little of us, and yet should we choose the free will you have given us to follow Jesus Christ as our Savior, we will discover wealth and security beyond imagination for all of eternity. One day soon you will bring your kingdom to earth and every knee will bend and every head will bow and the worship and the lordship of our Jesus, to the lordship of our Jesus Christ. Create in us the knowledge and the courage to follow after what we know to be the right and correct ways. Those ways that you have taught us from your holy and living word. Help us to be the people you are proud to call your own. Fill this church and each of us with your Holy Spirit. Come and listen to our praises and our song. Bless our worship this morning and help us to grow. For it's in the name of our precious Lord and Savior Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we go to our, our hymn. Jesus, you're the sweetest theme of all. Yesterday was sweetest day. of reading this morning is from Psalms 31, 14 through 16. I trust you, O Lord. You are my God. My future is in your hands. Rescue us from our enemies, for those who persecute us. Smile on me. Save me with your mercy. Amen. Our praise hymn this morning. Uh, some of our kids are out, so we'll have a praise thing without the kids, I guess, this morning. And uh, if you have your hymnals, you can turn to page 59 page 59 in your red hymnals. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. As I said, yesterday was sweetest day, so we ought to celebrate the sweetness of our Lord Jesus Christ. 59. <laughs> I think it's the first and third verse. There have been names that I have loved to hear, but never has there been a name so dear to this heart of mine. 
is a name divine, the precious, precious name of Jesus. Jesus is the sweetest name I know, and he's just the same as his holy name, and that's the reason of why I love him so. Oh, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. And someday I shall see him face to face to thank and praise him for his wondrous grace. Which, which he, he gave, gave to me when he made me the blessed Son of God called Jesus. Jesus is the sweetest name I know, and he's just the same. As his lovely name, and, and that's the reason why I love him so. Oh, Jesus is the sweetest name I Our memory verse this morning is uh, the same as it's been all month. I think the kids have pretty much got it down. We have one more week for them to have it fully memorized. But 1 Corinthians 10.30, wherefore, uh, there, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Amen. A blessed reading of God's word. Hello. I know I've got a couple here with laryngitis, so the you know somebody's going to have to sound two or three times as loud as as normal. But the sun's out. It's a it's a great day. I I, uh, uh, I know we have some that are out sick this morning, and and. Uh, some that are are just making it, but glad glad and thankful that they are they are here to uh, um, this morning. I wanted uh, again. We'll have uh, we were, we were going to go swimming today, but I got a lot of kids out sick, or and a lot of kids out uh, the 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 other parents' house. So uh, we'll we'll redo that, but we'll still have a, a, a modified potluck. We have some ham left over from last week. We'll have ham sandwiches and 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 nice little time after after church. Uh, we will have Bible study at seven. Uh, um, Sharon, have you been getting something out of Bible study Wednesday nights? And I know the young men have been been coming. Linda, you too. And uh, um, it, we've kind of, uh, I don't think we've taken it, but we, we've uh, really been working into the Proverbs and having a, having a good time uh, dissecting those and, and, and how, did, how they are modified or how, not, not so much modified, but how they, they apply uh, to today and how we can uh, uh, word them for meanings in our own life. Um, we started last week uh, to have our our young uh, kids program out, and it went really well. So we'll we'll continue uh, continue with that. So all of the kids are coming on Wednesday now, and and we have help with uh, we have help with uh, the older kids, and then uh, I'll take the younger kids home, and the older kids stay for for uh, class. Last week they had painting class, and uh, that actually I didn't bring the teachers paint in because these look exactly like the the teacher's painting so uh, uh, but this is what they did they're getting ready for uh, 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 Veterans Day uh, coming up the 11th and so they wanted to do a a, 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 a painting that would, uh, would you know 
go towards that that uh, that event. And so I thought they did a pretty good job, right? Don't you? That looks pretty good for uh, uh, for them. And and so now they after the showed them off here, I can let them go home. But they they've dried, and we have a great we have a great uh, painting uh, instructor. They're going to be the next time they come together next month. Uh, they'll also be painting, probably be a Thanksgiving theme. <clears throat> I still want to thank uh, all of those who are helping us out financially and and uh, but, you know we have christmas coming and other things coming and and uh, bills coming in and and uh, any help that you can give us i appreciate it this time of the year i know many people are are uh, um going through uh depression and and uh, so i want to make sure that if you uh are having uh, some difficulty, uh, difficulty in your life, that you give us a call here at the church, 967-3628. That's 967-3628. And uh, uh, talk to me about uh, about counseling, and we'll get you in to do, do, some, do some counseling. I know we have several of our, our young people that have been uh, struggling, um, and uh, uh, we're looking to do some programs with them as well. All right, so it's good to have all of you here, and it's good to have uh, you that are watching us from home as well. Again, I'm still looking for, for help. That's because I've, I've uh, converted some of the teens into uh, 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 helpers. It uh, doesn't mean that I, I don't need any more adult help. I still need some adult help, and anybody uh, that wants to is welcome to come. And I, I just simply want to make sure that, that you know that everybody that comes to the church is welcome to come to come here. Our doors are open, and and we look forward to uh, uh, you know serving you in our community as well. This we're you know we're uh, um, we're an open and friendly church, and so we'd like for you to to if you're not don't have a home church, please uh, uh, give us give us a consideration. Do we have any uh, uh, prayer requests or praises this morning? First, anybody have a praise? Yes. All right. How about prayer requests? Yes. For Sharon to get better. For Sharon to get better, yes. I know you kids are are uh, uh, feeling left out that she's not able to holler at you, right? <laughs> okay. Anyone else this morning have a, a praise or a prayer request? All right, we want to keep uh, all of our uh, kids that are out this morning uh, in prayer a as well. And um, uh, my mom and the Schaefer family and Sharon and, and her family as well. Anyone else this morning? Let's go to the... Oh, and I know that, that um, uh, you know, uh, we have our people that watch us from home. We'll keep you in our prayers, uh, Mary and Nora. Uh, and we'll keep you in our prayers as well. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Most Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the many, many things that you do for us. And we thank you for this country that we live in. And we ask you to, to uh, somehow bring, bring this country to a place where we can, we can have the peace that, that we need to to move forward and do the things that we need to in this country. We know that this is a starting the election cycle and Lord we just ask you to, to continue to, to bring peace to this country. We ask you to, to uh, watch over all of those who, who are running and leading this country that you will guide them and, and direct them as well. We're, we thank you for, for people who, who stand up for the Lord listening to the radio this morning coming in about a football player who was chastised for wearing a I'm a Christian headband. Lord, we just give us the opportunity to continue to, to live our lives loudly as Christians and not, not be ashamed of that. Lord, we ask you to, to uh, be with those that we, we have mentioned this morning, Sharon and her voice and, and Sharon's family as, as uh, the, they will go through this flu with them. We ask you to be with the rest of our kids who are, who are not here this morning and are out. We ask you to be with the Schaefer family and my mom and, and we just ask you to continue to, to watch over this church and help us to develop and grow and be the people that we need to be. 
help us to continue to reach out to, to the kids and, and, and develop them and that they will find that coming to youth group and to Sunday school are, are, are valuable in their lives. Watch over us and guide us. Be with all of those who serve this country, whether they be in the military or, or in police uniforms or, or um, firemen or EMTs or all the many people who serve this country. Watch over each and every one of them as well. Guide us and help us to be, be strong and stand fast for all that you have taught us. In Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen. Voice and with the sea, oh, praise him. Hallelujah. Page two seventy two, if you have a burning sun with golden wings, thou silver moon with softer. to your Bibles. We're going to continue on with uh, uh, our Romans. Uh, we're in the fourth chapter. We'll begin with verse six. So if you, as you go to uh, your Bible, I'm going to mention one other thing. One of the reasons that, that uh, you know, it, it, it was kind of scary for me this week to listen to some of the statistics that have come out this week or within the last couple weeks, that is, you know, that 
that we've got all of this all of this freedom that the incidences of syphilis are have increased by 30 percent in this country and in Canada it's a terrible number right along next to that is the church attendance even though it was low before the church attendance is down by another 26 percent and atheism is up by 17 percent from where it was so we have a we have a big chore to do because the country is clearly turning in a direction uh, away from away from our Lord Jesus Christ and we're we're doing I I just uh, last week had a church uh, call me want me to to apply for uh, a job uh, there and, and uh, uh, they identified themselves as a seeker friendly church and I had to tell them right off the bat that you know uh, you got the wrong person for a seeker friendly church I, I'm, I'm got strictly preach out of the gospel period all right Romans 4 20, uh, 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 6 through 25 David says the same thing about those who are are blessed God approves the people without their earning it. David said, Blessed are those whose disobedience is forgiven and whose sins are pardoned. Blessed is the person whom the Lord no longer considers sinful. Are only the circumcised people blessed or are uncircumcised people blessed as well? Paul is asking. We say, Abraham's faith was regarded as God's approval of him. How was it? How was his faith regarded as God's approval? Was he circumcised or was he uncircumcised at that time? Paul asked. He had not been circumcised when he believed God and placed his faith in God. Abraham's faith was regarded as God's approval while he was still uncircumcised. The mark of circumcision is a seal of that approval. Therefore, he is the father of every believer who is not circumcised and their faith too is regarded as God's approval of them. He is also the father of those not, not only are, who are not only circumcised but also are following in the footsteps of his faith. Our father Abraham had that faith before he was circumcised. So it was not by obeying Moses' teaching that Abraham or his descendants received the promise that he would inherit the world. Rather, it was through God's approval of Abraham's faith. If those who obey Moses' teaching are the heirs, then faith is useless and the promise given by faith is worthless. The laws of Moses' teachings bring about anger, but were where laws do not exist, they cannot be broken. Therefore, the promise is based on faith so that it can be a gift. Consequently, the promise is guaranteed for every descendant, not only for those who are descendants by obeying Moses' teaching, but also for those who are descendants by believing in as Abraham did. He is the father of us all. The scripture says, I have made you a father of many nations. Abraham believed when he stood in the presence of the God who gives life to dead people and calls into existence things that do not exist. When there was nothing left to hope for, Abraham still hoped and believed. As a result, he became a father of many nations. He, as he had been told, that is how many descendants you will have. Abraham didn't weaken. Through, through faith, he regarded the facts. His body was already as good as dead now that he was about 100 years old and Sarah was unable to have children. He didn't doubt God's promise out of a lack of faith. Instead, giving honor to God for the promise, he became strong because of faith and was absolutely confident that God would do what he promised. That is why his faith was regarded as God's approval of him. But the words, his faith was regarded as God's approval of him, were written not only for Abraham, but they were written also for you and I. Our faith will be regarded as God's approval of us, who believe in the one who brought Jesus, our Lord, back to life. Jesus, our Lord, was handed over to 
to death because of our failures and was brought back to life so that we could receive God's approval. Freedom from guilt. David lived under the law. Abraham did not did not because no law had been given during his lifetime. The Mosaic system didn't come along until 400 years after Abraham. However, although David lived under the law, David could never be saved under the law or even by the law. And therefore, David described the blessedness that God reckons righteousness without works. Because David had no works. The works that he had were evil. And therefore, righteousness must be totally apart and separate from works. Righteousness must come on an entirely different principle. Verse 7 tells us, saying, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. This is a, is a direct quote from Psalms 32 verses 1 and 2. And this is one of the great uh, uh, remorseful psalms of David. Psalm 51 is the other one. These verses are the outcome of David's great sin and his confession and acceptance which followed. Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven. Iniquities are bad things, sins. You, are you one of the blessed ones today? Well, I'm glad to be in that company or in that number. Blessed expresses that glorious, wonderful joy of sins forgiven. As a psychologist, I can tell you I have had many patients who struggle with guilt and depression in their lives. I have even had many patients who uh, who had schizophrenic episodes brought on by guilt. Guilt is at the bottom of nearly all suicides and suicidal attempts and can be found in nearly every psychiatric disorder. Even children who have been abused struggle with guilt, believing that they somehow are at fault. Now, there, before I go farther, I want to make it clear that anyone who has been abused isn't at fault, isn't guilty never deserve to be abused. But guilt may be at the core of the problem surrounding the abuser, and guilt is most often inherited by the person who has been abused. Guilt is an underlying concept for alcoholics and drug addicts. We all at times struggle with guilt, as David did. So here the bottom line. Guilt is inherent in our DNA. We don't have to go someplace to read something or learn from someone how to be and feel guilty. That quite easily is part of nearly every person born on this planet. I believe God put guilt in us to bring us to a point where we will come to our knees to God to ask for forgiveness. We are born into sin. Therefore, we are dead in our sins. Had it not been for God's grace and Jesus' death and resurrection, we would be we sh we should had it not been for Jesus' death and resurrection, we should be thankful for the guilt that brings us to salvation. If we say that we have no sin, that we're not guilty, that we have no sin, we just we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make God a liar, and God's word is not in us. The most wonderful feeling in the world is to be living our lives free from all this guilt. Much of what we place upon ourselves, and seriously, most of which, and, and which mostly is deserved. We're not free from guilt because we are not free from sin. But when we come to a place in our lives where we realize this, and come to God and ask for forgiveness, the most wonderful feeling in the world is to be forgiven. When you do something bad and you know mom or dad is going to pitch a fit and you go to them and apologize and they throw their arms around you, what a wonderful feeling that is. But just the same, we have the ability to go to God, God knowing ahead of time that if we confess our sins with all honesty, God will keep his promise. He will forgive us. And he will embrace us.
There is a parable in Matthew that, that uh, uh, Jesus talks about. And it's the parable, parable of the prodigal son. And, is, and, and it's just such an example. This son was headstrong. He didn't want to listen. He knew everything. You couldn't tell him anything. You couldn't tell him nothing. He was so selfish he was willing to injure his brother and his father in a family business because he demanded his share, which required them to sacrifice. But they did it anyway. This prodigal son did exactly what every parent would predict would happen. He didn't go to college to get a degree so he could have a career and a wonderful life and help his family out after. He didn't go to a trade school either. He knew everything and he needed no help at it. So what happened? He wound up one day penniless, homeless, and laying in a pool of pig manure. He decided to go home. I am sure he was very nervous about meeting his father. He felt guilty, and he, and he was. So he practiced what he would say to his father. He would ask just to be a hired hand on the farm. When he came to his father, his father threw his arms around the boy and hugged him until his eyes nearly popped out. The boy didn't really need to say much. The father didn't make him grovel in the dirt either. The boy asked to return to the farm and asked to be a hired hand. And that was all he needed to say for the father to accept that as asking for forgiveness. And the father forgave his son. He called for a banquet. And because the boy smelled like pig manure, gave him a bath and new clothes, put shoes on his feet and a ring on his finger. And the boy who had been lost and was dead was now found and alive. This is the example we are given by Jesus of our Father, a true Father's love and His forgiveness and how that is played out and should be played out in our lives. This boy surely felt wonderful beyond his ability to express. Probably he cried first with tears of sadness then with tears of great joy. This is the feeling waiting for every person who is willing to recognize their guilt and come to the Father for forgiveness. You see, we are all the prodigal sons, and the, one, and the wonder and beauty await us at the moment we are ready. David knew this, and God blessed him for it. But way too many people just want to hang on to their guilt and allow it to turn into anger and hate and all sorts of problems. It is just too simple to turn to God. And what a wonderful feeling it is to be free from our guilt, forgiven, and one with the Lord Jesus Christ, as David knew. That is why David saw great favor coming from God. Even when David deliberately broke the law, he didn't do it ignorantly, he knew what he did. He asked for forgiveness, and he was forgiven, which speaks of the tenderness of God by taking the sinner into his arms of love and receiving him with affection. His sins are covered. How? Because Jesus Christ died and shed his blood so that God may have a way to forgive. Had Jesus not died, God would not have had a way to forgive. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. In other words, joyful is the man whose sins the Lord will not put onto his account. When I talk about his account, we're talking about the account up in heaven. And blessed is the man who doesn't have all these things put to his account up there. David was a great sinner, and God put away his sin. As Nathan informed him, Nathan said to David, The Lord hath put away thy sin. In other words, he had erased the sin. Thou shalt not die. David was a, David's sin was great. He took a wife of another man. Nevertheless, David was chastened. There was an earthly penalty for such a sin. Nathan presented a problem before David concerning a, a, a ewe lamb, a, a baby lamb, and David said that the one who was wrong should pay four times. David said his own penalty when he responded to Nathan's account of the rich man who took the poor man's ewe lamb. And he shall restore the lamb four times, fourfold, said Samuel. Four of David's children were killed. The child of Bathsheba, Amnon, his first son, Absalom, and Agenai. They were all, all four of them were, were killed. 
sorrow plagued David all the days of his life. David's guilt was not put on his account, though. Another bore it for him. Little wonder that he could say, Joy is the man whose sin the Lord will in no wise put to his account. The argument now returns in our scripture. The argument now returns to Abraham to illustrate that justification is universal. Since David was spoken of, of the joy of the man under the law was, who was, since David has spoken of the joy of the man under the law who has been forgiven, the answer given to Paul by the, many of the people was, Dave, was that David was forgiven because David belonged to the circumcision and only the circumcision could expect this. For this reason, Paul returns to Abraham to show that Abraham was justified or forgiven or excused by God before the law was given and also before there was circumcision. God made the promise to him and he believed God long before there was a man, uh, any kind of argument made or agreement made. Other than that, God said he would do it. Abraham believed the naked word of God. God made that promise to Abraham long before circumcision was introduced. Abraham just believed God. That's all. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, Paul tells us, and the promise made of none effect. Because the law worketh fit wrath, for, there, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. You see, God saved Abraham by faith alone. Now notice something else here. Abraham was justified. He was absolved by his faith and faith alone in the resurrection. If you keep the law, meaning that you could live your entire life without breaking even one little part of the law, the Ten Commandments given by God to Moses, and you lived a sinless life, then you don't need faith. You, and you wouldn't need a promise of salvation by faith from God. You could earn your way into heaven. But none of us can do that. Satan is around to make sure that cannot happen, and our true nature is around uh, 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 and in us to make sure that that cannot happen as well. We all sin, and since we all sin, we need something other than the law. We need someone who can cleanse us from our sins. That is what the blood of Jesus does. It cleanses us and makes us white as snow. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, talking about Abraham, neither yet the dead, deadness of Sarah's womb. There is no merit in faith itself. You see, there was nothing around Abraham in which he could trust, nothing that he could feel, nothing that he could see. Nothing was there. All he did was believe in God. That's all he had, and that's important. God took him out away from Ur, and he made this promise, and there was nothing else for him to hold on to but that promise. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, give, giving glory to God. He was not double-minded. That's the whole thought here. He looked away from his present circumstances to the promise. He believed the promise of life everlasting in spite of the fact that that the circumstances nullified it, those circumstances being he was old and Sarah was well past her ability to give birth. Abraham still believed. He put confidence in the promise because of the one who gave it, even though it seemed absolutely absurd, this promise. Abraham was able to look at who gave the promise and he believed and thus giving worship to God. You see, man was created to glorify God, but by disobedience, he did the opposite. And the only way you can glorify God is by believing him. When you believe God, you glorify God. You come here 
to your church. And by coming here to church, you glorify God. Many people come to church for many different reasons. Some come to find a way to ease their pain and guilt. If you open your ears and your heart and you can find that way because God is always here available for you. Many people come to church to pretend they are Christians when they yet have, have, have not come to God in repentance uh, and, and have not softened their hearts. Even for those who come to God with fake reasons, God is still here. He's available. That does not mean that they can pull the wool over God's eyes. God is not naive. He can read our hearts. He is here already with open arms waiting for you, but you still have to come to God on God's terms, which is being truly repentant and desiring to be forgiven. God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, but we still have to come to God with sincerity and a heart that has been emptied of our human pride. It is Pride that keeps us from truly accepting God by faith alone. When we remove our pride, God is able to remove our guilt. If or when we are fully persuaded that we need to come to God to lay down our burdens, then we can claim the promise in Romans 4.22 for ourselves. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. In other words, there, he was, that was uh, taking off of his record. This faith, is the re- this faith is the resurrection, life from the dead. It is what God accepted from Abraham in lieu of his own righteousness, which Abraham did not have. God decided Abraham God declared Abraham righteous for his faith in the promise of God to raise up a son out of the womb of death, that is, the womb of Sarah. God God promises eternal life to those who believe that he raised up his own son from the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, the place of death. Now, it was not written for his sake, Abraham's sake alone, that it was imputed to him. But for all of us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. It wasn't something special just for Abraham. It is given for us as well. The womb of Sarah was a tomb. It was a place of death. Sarah was way, way too old to have a child when, when the Lord promised to give her a child. But what is it that there is that is impossible for God? Your answer should always be nothing. There is nothing impossible for God. So even though Sarah was too old to have a child, God promised her and, and Abraham won anyway. God, I believe, purposely waited until Sarah was too old to conceive. Her womb was dead. Nothing could live there. That is why Paul says it was a tomb, a place of death. But out of that place of death, God raised a child to be born from that tomb, from that dead womb, simply because God could do that, and also because Abraham believed. This is a parallel story. It mimics the death of Jesus Christ. Out of that place of death, that tomb, God raises, raised Jesus from the dead, just as he raised a child from Sarah's dead and ancient womb. It always fascinates me how we go into the New, New Testament and we find the fulfillment or the parallel, exact parallel fulfillment of that. Uh, and we go way back to before Jesus came and, and find things that connect together. Such a position to, for us to disbelieve God is an insult to God, just as the Muslim religion of Islam is also an insult to God. They refuse to recognize the virgin birth and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You insult God by calling him a liar, and you do the same thing when you come to the conclusion that God cannot save you. Many people 
come to the foolish conclusion they don't want to be saved. But in my practice, I have heard many people tell me that God could never save them because of all the bad things that they have done in their lives. When you limit God, you insult him. Abraham believed God, and this is what the Lord Jesus meant when he said, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. This is a New Testament statement Jesus made in John 8, 56. Jesus was delivered up to sinful and prideful and hating hands to be tortured, ridiculed, spit upon, and crucified for all the sinful things we have done. But God raised Jesus again for our justification. That is faith not only in the death of Christ, but also in his resurrection. Matthew Henry put it like this. In Christ's death, he paid our debt. In his resurrection, he took out our acquittance, meaning our release. Not only did Jesus pay the price for our sins by his death, but he triumphantly arose to go back to that prison, stand before the bars that held us captive, the gates of hell, and he demanded that those gates be opened and those of us who believe release. We sang this mor- the, uh, the song this morning about people coming racing out because if your name is called, you can come racing out of that grave, racing out of that death. Had Jesus dis- just died, who would have demanded our release from the captivity of hell? Jesus had to be raised because he had to demand the prison gates be open for us to be released or else we, we might still be held there in, within those prison walls. Jesus stands before those gates leading to hell and he calls your name to come forward. Now, after God and Jesus have done all the work and Jesus stands before the gates of hell and calls your name with a loud and clear voice, the decision to come forward and fly out of that grave is always yours. We should come flying out of that prison and prostrate ourselves before Jesus Christ with repentance and love and faith in our hearts. If we could do that, we would find the swift arms of our Lord reaching down to pick us up and wrap themselves around us. We can be free from all that guilt and shame and sin. If only we would. God justifies, meaning God makes them a new innocent creature before the court. Their fine is paid and their record is wiped clean. They can walk out a free and new man if they will only accept and believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Can anything be more wonderful than that? Have you gone that far with God today? Do you believe him? You are given the gift more valuable than gold or rubies or diamonds. If only you will reach out and take it. God stretches his hand out with open palm, with salvation in it. He puts it. My grandfather used to go around the church and he put a nickel in his hand and and just open it up with an open palm. And he said, salvation is just like this nickel right here in my hand. Will you reach out and take it? Because once you take it, it belongs to you. It's yours. That's how simple salvation is. God reaches out for us with his palm open to present salvation. All we have to do is just accept it. We don't have to weigh our guilt. We don't have to come with this excuse, I'm I'm too guilty. I've done too many bad things. I think that's why... Why, why we're given examples such as Paul and David and Abraham in the Bible. Because we're all people. But we all are given this opportunity to reach into God's hand. To be the prodigal son and realize God's arm around us. Have you ever been forgiven? Have you ever done something bad and been forgiven? <laughs> Have you ever felt that wonderful feeling there is that when you do something wrong and you ask, your, ask somebody to forgive you and they do and they put their arms around you and you hug and you kiss and isn't that a wonderful feeling? You can have that today just by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. 
our hymn of dedication this morning. Jesus, you're the sweetest name of all. to realize that we need a savior. Will our usher please come forward for our offerings this morning? Will you please rise? You're standing? All right. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Dear most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you do for us. And we, Lord, we just ask you to be with each and every person who watches this sermon and give them the opportunity to come to you for salvation. Be with us this week. Watch over us and guide us. Help us to live our lives pleasing to you. Help us to reach out to others around us and ask them to come to church or Bible study or youth group. And Lord, we just ask you to help us live this, this life with full of joy that people may see us and, and wonder, you know, what is different about you so that we can just raise our arms and say, we're in love with Jesus Christ. Guide us and lead us this week and keep your hand upon us. Give us each the ability to, to go to, to our Bibles this week and read, to invite someone to Sunday school, to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to someone. 
All these things we ask in the name of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.